This is the second part of the video on how to do phylogenetic reconstruction using, or using molecular characters. So at this point, we've gotten our characters, we've done an alignment, and we go straight to parsimony. And you might say, well, why on earth are we doing that? Why aren't we going to first try to figure out homologies? And then of those homologies, let's figure out what the synapomorphies are. But with molecular characters, we can't do any of those things, so we go straight to parsimony. Why is it that, that we have to do this? Well, how are you going to tell a homology from an analogy when you're working with a DNA sequence? Okay? Complex morphological structures allow inference of homology. But if you're looking at a DNA sequence, and two sequences have an A at a particular position, there's nothing to go to to try to figure out whether those A's are actually homologous with one another or not, or whether or not they're analogies with respect to each other. We can't use any of the criteria that we set out for, uh, for morphological features to try to determine whether or not two A's, for example, are in fact, in fact homologous. So since we can't figure out whether or not we're looking at homologies or analogies, we just abandon that effort and go straight to parsimony and try to figure out what the best tree is. So whenever we're working with uh, DNA sequences or protein sequences, homology and analogy are figured out after we get done building the tree or posteriorly, uh, formally speaking. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to go straight to our optimization technique, in this case, parsimony. How are we going to do parsimony? Let's take a look at a simple example of how we can do this. Let's start with five different sequences from different species, and these are going to be really simple sequences. The first one will be G, C, A, T, T. The second sequence will be G, C, T, T, T. The third sequence will be A, A, C, G, T. The fourth sequence will be A, T, T, G, T. And the fifth sequence will be A, A, T, T, A. So each one of these represents a different species. Species 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Now, as you'll remember, if we have five different species, there are 15 different unrooted uh, phylogenetic trees that we could make for that. We're not going to go through all 15, but let's work through one example of how we're going to figure out the number of steps on the tree. All right, so we have an example here where we can uh, understand how we actually go through the process of determining how many steps there are on an evolutionary tree using DNA sequence data. So if you look in the upper left corner, I have five very short DNA sequences um, numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, we'll assume we got those from five different species. And as there are 15 different uh, unrooted topologies for five uh, taxa. Now we're not going to go through all 15, but what you see in the middle of the board or the screen is one of the 15 topologies. So what I'd like to do is work through how we would get the number of steps on this tree for this topology. Um, and you can see I've labeled the tips of that tree with the numbers of the different species. So what we're gonna go, going to do now is remove those tips and put in the actual values uh, of those sequences at the tips. And then we'll work through uh, the process of getting those, uh, the size of that tree or how many steps are on that tree. So G, C, A, T, T here. And for species 2, G, C, T, T, T. For species 3, double A, C, G, T. Species 4, A, double T, G, T. And species 5, double A, double T, and then A. All right, so we've got our sequences for the species at the tips. What we're going to do is we're going to work our way into the tree, determining as best we can what the sequences should be at each internal node on the tree. 
And then once we've worked our way in the tree, we'll work our way back out and assign where the changes actually take place. So to figure out the uh, sequences at the internal nodes, what we'll do is use the principle of parsimony. So let's start here with species 1 and 2. So species 1, species 2. And let's look. In the first position, they both have a G. So clearly the most parsimonious thing to say is that their common ancestor at this node right here also has a G in that first position. They also both have C's in their second position, so we'll put a C here. Now when we get to the third position, things get more complicated. We have an A and a T. And there's no real way to decide which one's the right one, so we'll just for the time being put A and T because we don't know what we want to do with that yet. Similarly, at the fourth position, we don't have an issue. We have a T and a T, so we'll just put a T here. And in the fifth position, we have a T and a T, so we'll just put a T there. All right, so now we'll go to this node here and we'll use the sequences for species three and four to figure that out. At position one, they both have an A, so we'll just put an A. At position two, they have an A or a T, so we'll just put A or T because we don't know what we want. Position three, C or T, again, we don't know what we want, so C or T. Position four, both G. Position five, both T, so we'll just put a G and a T there. Now, what are we going to do for this node here? For this node, we use the information from species 5 and the information that we inferred at this node here. So let's do the comparison there. Both of them have A at position 1, so we'll just simply put an A here. Then we have an A here in species 5 and an A or a T in that position. So since species, uh, not the inferred sequence for that node has an A, then we might as well, by parsimony, the simplest explanation, say that that position is an A, since they both have an A in common. Position 3, we have a T here in species 5 and a C or a T. So again, by parsimony, we just say that that's a T. Position 4, we have a T here or a G, so that is a conflict. We'll just put it down as G or T. And similarly, we have an A or a T here, so we'll put that it could be T or it could be A. So now we have inferred sequences at all of the internal nodes. So we can go ahead and start assigning how many steps or changes there are on this tree, and we'll do those in green. All right. So how do we do this? Well, let's take the sequences at this internal node and this internal node and compare them and see where we have to have changes. So for position one, there's an A here and a G here. Well, there's no way to resolve that conflict. So somewhere on this branch, somewhere on that branch, there has to have been a change of either a G to an A or an A to a G. We don't know which one, but there had to be a change, and so we'll symbolize that by a hatch mark there. How about the second position? Well, we have an A here, and we have a C there. Again, there's got to have been a change on that branch. That C either changed to an A or the A changed to a C, so we'll put another hatch mark there. How about position three? Well, position three is a T here, and it's an A or a T here. So since they both have T in common at this point, since we're assigning changes, we'll just say both of them had a T. So let's erase this A, and we'll just say that that sequence is a T there. All right, how about in the fourth position? We have a G or a T here, or a T. So again, they have T's in common with each other, so we'll get rid of that G, and we'll call that a T. How about the fifth position? An A or a T here, a T there, and so by the same principle, we'd just say it was a T. Okay. So there were two changes on this internal branch here. All right, now we continue to work our way out and we see where else there have to be changes. How about on this internal branch right here? Okay, well, we'll use the sequences at the internal nodes. So 
let's go through and compare between these sequences. I'll use blue to do this so we don't get confused. All right, this has an A at the first position. This has an A at the first position. No change necessary. This has an A, and this has a T or an A. Following our same procedure before, we say, okay, well, then we'll just keep the A here. Then we have a T here and a C or a T here. So again, since they both have a T, we'll just keep that T. Then we have a T here and a, and a G there. So that's a change that we can't reconcile through parsimony. So there has to be a change on this branch where either that T changes to a G or the G changed to a T. All right, and then in the final position, they both have T's. So there was definitely a change on that branch. All right, and now we just work our way out to the tips and look for any other changes that we need to resolve sequences. So let's look here at this sequence and this sequence. They both have A at their first position. They both have A at their second position. Then there's a T or a C, so we've got to have a change for that on this branch. Then they both have G, then they both have T. All right, so one change there. Now, let's compare that same internal sequence to this sequence out here for species number three, or four rather, and let's see what we get in that case. In that case, we have an A at the first position for both of them. Then we have an A or a T, so there has to be a change for that. Then there's a T in the third position for both, a G in the fourth for both, and a T in the fifth for both. So we had to have a change on that branch. All right, now let's work our way out on the other end. We still have to work our way out from this node here out to the two branches that have species one and two. So let's take care of that. All right, so for this sequence up here, it has a G and so does the internal one a C at the second position for both, then an A or a T, so we'll need a change for that. Then they both have T's at the fourth and T's at the fifth position, so no changes there. And finally, to finish this out, we'll look at this sequence for species two and compare it to the internal node sequence. G at the first position, C at the second, T, T, T for both of them. So no changes are needed on that branch at all because the ancestral sequence and the sequence at the tip is, uh, are, they're both identical. So now we are done and we can count up the total number of changes on the tree. One change here, two changes here, one change here, one change here, and one change here. So that adds up to one, two, three, four, five, six total changes on this tree. Now we don't know yet whether or not this is really the most parsimonious tree or not because there are still another 14 topologies that we would have to go through the same procedure on. But if the other 14 topologies had seven or more changes on them, this would end up being the most parsimonious tree. But we don't know that yet. Okay, so that's the basic process. Now you can see why we would get a computer to do this whenever possible because uh, it is kind of tedious. But once we've figured out which one is the most parsimonious one, we have our unrooted tree, and we can then root the tree and get our, our, our character polarities. So how are we going to do that? Well, there's really only one way to do this um, on uh, this type of a tree. We end up having to do what is called outgroup comparison. So let's say that this, we'll start with a really simple tree. Let's say this turned out to be our simplest four taxon tree, the one with the least number of steps. How are we going to figure out where to root it? Well, we'll take an out group, what we call an out group, which we'll call in this case species E, and we'll use parsimony just like we did before to decide where E goes. So we'll try all the places that E could go, all the five branches, We'll try E on all five of those branches, and whichever one gives us the shortest tree, that will then be where we put the root of this tree. And then we take our unrooted tree here, 
and we root it. So let's just say for the sake of argument for the moment that the proper place to root E after we check is right here. All right, the easy way to do this is just to work our way in. So let's number our nodes to make this easy to follow. This is going to be our root node. This will be node number one, and this will be node number two. So if E is the outgroup, there's E. We break this branch here, right there. And that's going to go up to the, that's going to become our root right here. And then the root is going to go all the way up. So there's our root. The root is going to go all the way up to D. And it's also going to go to node number one, okay, which is right here. Node number one then goes up to species C and out to node number two. And node number two goes to A and B. And that's our rooted tree. Now here, because we were working with uh, a set of molecular data, the only way we could get the root on the tree was to do an outgroup comparison like this. You could also, uh, if you were working with morphological data, basically use morphological uh, rules for figuring out the order of events as well. So you could use the outgroup, you could use information about fossil record data, and you could also use information um, from embryological development. Um, we're not going to show how to do that, but it's basically the same kind of procedure as what we've done here. All right, so once we've got the tree rooted like that, then we can determine the character polarities because now we know the ordering of events. Remember we said it might be an A to a G or a G to an A? Now we should be able to figure that kind of thing out because we know the order of events. We've put time back on the tree, okay? Now, of course, it might be possible that multiple roots will be equally compatible, but if you get enough data, you should be able to figure things out. And this has led to some really fantastic sorts of things. For example, here we uh, have uh, a modern tree showing the three major uh, kingdoms of plants, the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya. This all was only possible to determine that there was a difference between archaea and bacteria once we started working with DNA sequence data. Um, and if you're really interested in phylogenetic trees, I suggest you go to the Tree of Life uh, page, which is tollweb.org, and then you can explore the Tree of Life there. And I'd like to leave you with one of my favorite phylogenetic trees. Um, I'm not sure what data was used to reconstruct this, but uh, it's a lot of fun. I would suggest you go through it um, and memorize it for the exam.